Hey bimbos, welcome back to another episode of Hospo Bimbo. I am your host Cassie, and I am coming to you straight from the motherland. We're in America. Can you hear it in my voice? Can you hear the gallons of maple syrup that I've been consuming? Cold brew coffees? Breakfast for dinner? Cracker barrel? A fresh new coat of fat that has just pleasantly decided to surround my body? I love it. New year, new me. I'm absolutely thriving right now. And I'm quivering in my boots because I have a lot to share with you guys coming up. But we'll get more into that in another episode. I'm so excited to introduce my next guest today, Hubert Hachiski. I want to just start off by saying, by the time we actually were able to hit record for this episode, we were both cracking up so hard because for like an hour and a half, we were trying to work out the technologies. So this is a virtual recording, and it was actually recorded back in December. So I was dialing in from New Zealand early morning. He was dialing in from Germany in the late hours of a Saturday night. And we'd get on, neither of us could hear each other. Either I couldn't hear him or he couldn't hear me. We could see each other, but it was a silent film. Anyway, we got there in the end. So, Hubert, what an amazing guy. Private chefing at the Grand Prix in Australia, spearfishing remote Indonesian islands, becoming a freedive instructor, creating a spearfishing charter in Indo, lobstering in the Chatham Islands, cooking on yachts, I'm out of breath. But then to finding himself at the Sushi Chef Institute under Chef Andy Matsuda in Los Angeles. All of these different components are all cohesive and have created this big magic that is Hubert. I'm obsessed with Hugh's story and how he tells it. I I haven't met a lot of people in my life that really grab life by the horns, so to speak. His journey through his life has led him to so many unique and amazing opportunities that were all born simply out of a sheer excitement to try new things and plunge into the murky waters to find all the pearls. You won't hear much of me speaking in this episode because I just wanted to soak it all in, take note, and just let him ride it out. This is a two-parter because I really wanted to keep all the gritty bits leading up to how he's gotten to where he is today because it's a wild ride. In this first part, Hubert goes through his backstory and history, and the second part will be diving more into Sushi by Who, content creation, and most importantly, the importance on educating yourself on where your food comes from. If you go into a restaurant, ask questions, educate yourself. Hubert's goal is to be the change in a mass-produced food sphere by sourcing locally, educating himself and others, providing a unique experience, all while continuing to travel and learn. All of these components add to his irreplaceable art of chefing. You pair that mentality with Hospo, and you've got yourself a goddamn wildfire, baby. Let's get into it. I love it. I love it because that was that was a perfect example of expensive technology meets two people who are just like trying to figure out what the what is going on. The the most important thing is the audio quality being high. That's that's mm. all that's all it is. So Hubert, why don't you introduce yourself? Um, my name is Hubert Hachiski, a very hard Polish last name. I'm born in Canada, Montreal. I was a little baby when we moved out. My parents are both Polish. Then they moved back to Poland. I was six, my parents divorced. My mom uh, ran away to Hamburg with me. She met another man, fell in love, married him after a couple of years. I turned around 12, 13, 14. Uh, We went bankrupt. My mom went bankrupt. She divorced the man, lost everything, ended up on the streets, kinda. Strong woman, basically. My mom is just like the strongest woman I ever know. Um, yeah, she somehow managed to get her shit together in a couple of days, went to like a friend's place, got a new job, sorted our life. And then I was just a rebel. <laughs> I came from everything to nothing to building up most of the things I have right now in life, which is hospitality and the knowledge how to travel the world with nothing before we go any further obviously like looking at your instagram we all know that instagram is just like a highlight reel of everybody's life 
I mean, I've been following you for quite a few years now. And frankly, your Instagram is just insane. I never know where you actually are. You've got these beautiful photos of you spearfishing in Indonesia. Then you're in the Virgin Islands. And then you're like getting lobster in Miami. And then you're going to the Sushi Chef Institute in California. Like, how does that all transpire? And this is the most beautiful thing I have to say about being in hospitality, right? And I learned it in a very young age that people will always eat and drink no matter where you are. If you take that into perspective, if you can offer people hospitality all around the world from different cultures, you can use it anywhere you want. And then the fun part is obviously the highlight reel of your life. But between every photo is a very dar dark side, like... In my case, like every photo, photo has, a, has a price, either long working hours or if I look back at the Virgin Island pictures, I know that I've been so close to depressions. <laughs> every time I look at a photo, I'm like, I worked, I, I don't know, I worked from six in the morning till when do guests go to bed. That's, that's how I felt about when I lived in Hawaii. And everyone would see the photos I post. And they're like, oh my God, you're living such a great life. But I was getting up at three, working at the Hilton, finishing there at 11, going for a swim, then going to make coffee for a few hours, then finishing the night till midnight serving. So people don't really see the behind the scenes of that. I think I'm quite lucky that I come from, like my apprenticeship here in Hamburg was harder than any other job I've taken afterwards. So... With like 18 till 21, I worked the hardest I've experienced in my life personally. And that I think set you up like you, you became so tough towards the, you know, violent environment of working hospitality, as well as like resistant to any like sort of verbal abuse in the kitchen. <laughs> like it's not easy back then obviously this is we're talking about like 12 years ago right <laughs> yeah basically whatever job you walked in afterwards was like a piece of cake and it was it was scary i was used to such a tempo and accuracy at work like two michelin stars a catering so it was like one one place that had two michelin stars a two michelin star restaurant bistro for over like 300 people per day two seatings so 600 people then events in like four different rooms one was up to a thousand people and the other ones were private dining and you're you're in a brigade of like 35 chefs and i worked in the two michelin star place for a year and i've only done the private dining department for a really long time and the buckets and the caterings and we used to do caterings from hamburg to berlin to salzburg like all around Germany and knowing this high speed environment of providing basically some of the best caterings in the world, there is no sleep. <laughs> sleep is in the yeah. car, you know, like you're on the way to Berlin and you're sleeping and then you're waking up and you, you're continuing. I don't know. It was just normal. It seemed normal because you, you don't have any comparison. So it was like, all oh, right, this is this is how we, you know, this is how we operate. When did you actually start out being a chef? Like, wh when did your hospo journey even begin? Uh, when I was 12, I was cleaning um, tables. I was like, I don't know how it's called, busing? Busing. Yeah. So back then in Germany, you could bus. Um, with a younger age, they changed the regulation a bit later. Because um, let me tell you, when my mom went bankrupt, we kind of like didn't have much. Um, so there was two options, go to school, listen to some teacher, um, or either go do something else. And I was just like, Hey, I don't, I'm going to go work. Like, I just want to be able to afford things in life. So I was like, the solution was working. So 12, 13, 14, I got like my first like hospital jobs. It was like summer jobs, nothing really like fancy or anything cool, but it was still work. You know, it was like, you go there, You might clean like a surface or a window, but it got the attitude of, hey, you know, this is my hours are rewarded in money. <laughs> And that's how it started. Yeah, I, I started at 14 busing yeah. tables. <laughs> And then fast forward 17 years and we're still here. <laughs> we're still, still here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, still here. I think when you learn something in that age, you kind of like either stick to it or I don't know, it will like stick with you. And I, I just, I love it. 
I hated it. I love. I have a love hate relationship <laughs> with hospitality. <laughs> it's like one of the only industries that allows you to freely travel. I mean, you could travel anywhere and get a hospital job, pretty much guaranteed work. Like you said before, everyone's eating, everyone's drinking. It's never going to go away. So there's always going to be work. That's how I've been able to travel. I don't know about you, but I don't. I mean, aside from being in New Zealand, I've shocked myself with how long I've been here. But usually, I go somewhere for a year and just work and then leave, so on and so forth. And it's the only job that seems to really allow that sort of lifestyle. I would agree. I think, especially with、um, the skilled visas. It seems like the the culinary world and the hospitality world always lacks, you know, like staff shortage is such a big deal right now, and people don't want to train those jobs because they're just like, I think the hours are hard. Everything about it is kind of like different from what you see other people do. I mean, looking at my job now, comparing it to hospitality, I'm like, oh god, you know, like. <laughs> I'm asking myself, what am I doing here? And I'm like, do I go back to hospitality? I'm like, yes, I should. I mean, like, I'm building my own brand, but we can talk about this later. So I have like specific sort of like milestones to reach.、Um, but、mm, now I'm I'm debating like, hey, can I go just back to yachting? Because it's <laughs> good money. <laughs> I'm just so intrigued by your life because, like, how did you get into yachting? Like, how did you get into that lifestyle? What was the work like? You obviously came to New Zealand at some stage, and if I recall, I think you were in Queenstown. And where were you working then? Um, rehab juice. That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. so <laughs> fun how job. How did you? <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to the, just... <laughs> to the guys. <laughs> <laughs> and the show's sponsor is Rehab Juice.、Um, Hopefully, Rich, if you hear this, <laughs> is it just juice or what is it? Oh no, it was food. It was healthy food for people who are massively hungover in Queenstown. Because if you know Queenstown, there is no healthy food. <laughs>、mm? No, there's not. So it was the only healthy food place in Queenstown. I think we would we would really have to start before yachting. Everyone asks me the same, and then I'm like, "Hey, you have to understand about <laughs> what's before yachting. <laughs> it's, it's it's way crazier." <laughs> okay. Hubert started out with a chef apprenticeship in Germany, and then one year in a restaurant, following totaling four years. He got to a point though where it was all just too much, bit too much pressure. So with nothing but 500 euros, 24 hours later, Hubert set off to Melbourne. His plan was just a holiday for two weeks, but by week one, 500 euro was going out the window. His money was running dry. Anyone who has traveled knows this situation. You either get on a plane to get back home, or you get a job. He reached a point where he didn't have enough money to even get a flight back home. He had a moment of clarity here on how lucky he was to have his hospo trade. Everyone in the restaurant industry was hiring in Melbourne, and he was getting offers from restaurants without even a glimpse at a CV, all wanting to hire him on the spot. With wages starting out at thirty-five dollars an hour, like, which is、now? insane. <laughs> like thirty-five、yeah. dollars an hour. Fuck. Yes, straight up. Like not even he didn't even want to see my CV. He's like, so you know how to cook? I'm like, yes. He goes, can you make me something? I'm like, okay. Like, what do you want? He goes, like, what can you do? I'm like, okay. This is this is, like, what do you want? And he goes, like, okay, make me a burger. I was like, okay, from scratch. Like how? And he's like taking out these frozen patties. I'm like, dude, like I, I don't do that. Like, let me do this for you, you know. And like, suddenly, like, we're making burgers, we're cooking soups, we're baking our own bread. And he's like, "What the fuck? Where are you from?" I'm like, "Ah,、oh, German chef, you know. We learn this shit straight up."、And、he's like, "Can you stay?" And I was like, "Okay, cool." I stayed like two months, three months, and I was like making bank, you know. For me, it was life changing experience, you know, from earning trash money here in Germany to like suddenly bank, bank, banging out like two and a half grand in a week. <laughs> What's going on? Yeah, <laughs> you know, my <laughs> as fast as the money came, as fast did it go. You know, <laughs> that's how it is.、Um, life experiences, of course, long working hours. I worked a lot.、Um, I always go to the gym my whole life,、um, so I never stopped that. And I think it's like also a magic recipe towards staying insane in that environment. 
Yeah, long story short, Melbourne worked there. I did cook the Grand Prix for at the Red Bull station for like a bit for I think seven days. And I think this is where like the mindset of all the people, if you hang around rich people, you learn what rich people do. All right. And this is where we're getting into the department uh, yachting, how you hear about it. And obviously standing at the Red Bull lounge for Formula One, cooking for the VIP section, only 30 people inside and like listening to them talk. I was like, okay, so he's like, yeah, we were on this yacht. This chef made these amazing things. And this is where it like first stuck. I was like, yacht, chef, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, I'm from Hamburg and we see like the biggest yachts because they get maintained here, but no one talks about the crew being on it. Everyone talks about the structure. Like, oh, it's a big boat, but there's hundred people working on it. And it never clicked. So I was like, okay, cool, whatever. There's chefs on yachts, right? How do you get into that? You have to be the best chef in the world or something like that. Like, because clearly money talks. If you can afford a private chef, he has to be badass, right? Down the line, I'm moving to Sydney. I'm working in Sydney uh, at the Opera. I won't say the name of the restaurant. Pretty much, I walk in. I saw two guys on the section. And I'm like, hey, guys, what's up? I'm coming in. Like, you know, same, like, $40 an hour, whatever. I'm like, sweet. And they're like, I walk in. I work one day. The next day, both dudes quit. And they're like, you can do this yourself. I'm like, oh, what the fuck? 800 covers a day. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> listen. <laughs> what do you mean they both quit? Yeah. <laughs> they went over it. <laughs> okay. They walked out. <laughs> the French and Italian guy, they looked at me and they're like, no, bro, like you get fucked here. And I'm like, okay, sweet. I'm just going to take it over myself, whatever. I did like two weeks and I was just like, nah, this is, this is bullshit. Like paninis and pesto, $12. Like it's trash. Like you can't, no quality. It's just quantity. Not mine. Definitely not mine. Didn't like it at all. I got broke there. <laughs> I had to steal a bike. I borrowed a bike. Okay. I stole it. <laughs> and then I gave it back to the same address. Um, I apologize for how, that. How I thoughtful know. of you. <laughs> well, I had to get to a job somehow and walking this... St- I couldn't afford a bus ticket, you know. Uh, it was mm. um, definitely a lifetime experience of experiences in a couple of years. <laughs> like, don't do bad things. Um, they will always come back to you. That's for sure. Uh, Sydney was cool. I don't like skyscrapers, so I had to go. I uh, went to Perth. Mm, a pair of was fun, but the restaurants were not so good at that time. I didn't feel comfortable working in those restaurants, so I decided not to work in restaurants because I walked in and if you know the fridges and freezers were moldy and like I looked at the chefs overworked. I was like, hey, if I want to work here, my cleaning standards are like different. Like this is I'm not gonna stand here. So I was too proud to cook in a kitchen in Perth. Way too proud. When were you in Perth? <sighs> like what year? I was living in Perth uh, in 2018. I, I was supposed to be there a year and I couldn't make it a year because I just had to get the hell out of there. I agree. You have to get out of there. Um, nothing against Perth. So I, like, I, I know a lot of people um, really enjoy it. Oh, dude, I was there 2013. <laughs> oh, okay. A little bit, <laughs> little bit before me. Yeah, I got broke there again. So this is my third time get, getting broke, right? So I had to find a job on Gumtree shoveling dirt. I kind of like was like, oh, you know what? I just want to do something physical without using my brain. Um, okay, some guy was like, hey, you can do some landscaping for like two weeks. If you get it done quicker than two weeks, I'll pay you extra money. Like I'll pay the whole hours. And I was like, I was like, how much are you going to pay? He's like, oh, yeah, free grand in two weeks. I'm like, okay, sweet. And I did it in like one, you know, I was like, okay, I just want to get the money. In the meantime, I was applying for jobs online for like resort. I found like an agency interviews you on your skill level, blah, blah, blah. And then they recommend you to like resorts and jobs and pretty much it took, and this is, this is what's crazy. You know, back then my head chef said, if you hold this like CV from where you, where you came from, you have a golden ticket. And I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? Golden ticket. Like, what do you want from me? It's in German, in English, you know? And I'm like, golden ticket, my ass, whatever. Uh, This, this, (laughs) this, I was so upset. Like you guys have been 
abusing me for the last three years. I worked so much in my life and I'm never gonna make anything. Never mind. That was a really, really <laughs> like back then narrow minded mindset. All right, so I'm using this golden ticket. The hedge of like <laughs> I called the agent guy, he interviewed me. 20 minutes later, the resort calls me the head chef. His name is Brad. Really awesome guy. He's a Kiwi. And Kiwi guy, dyslexic. Love him. But still today, one of my really good friends. Super awesome dude. He's, he's sailing on a boat for Indonesia and writing a cookbook from like... Dude is like just insane, you know? He's dyslexic and he's writing a book. And I'm like, ah, <laughs> okay, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Uh, he calls me and I was like just a positive I just uh, the thing is I was just like a positive editor. I'm like hey bro I just want to work and I want to make money I, I just want to work I want to make money and I, I'm not scared of working and he's like sweet you're hired you're coming tomorrow I'm like okay basically plane tickets I'm flying to Broome and I'm still not having a single dollar in my pocket yeah, basically, I'm ending up in Broom, and the hostel is like six k's away. I'm carrying a backpack with like fucking fifty pounds, sixty pounds through like this Broom humidity. I don't know where I'm going. I have no data, nothing. I'm just like walking, and I stopped at like this video renting place, DVD renting place. I walked in. I'm like, bro, can you give me some water? And he's like, yeah, it's like ten dollars. I'm like, I don't have any money. Can you like <laughs> gift it to me? And he's like, yeah, sure, take two waters. And I'm like. Thank you. And uh, this is where I learned kindness of people. It's just like insane. And I like started hitchhiking. Hey, I need to go to like this broom backpacker thing where they checked me in. And the lady was like, so how did you get here? I'm like, I walked and then I hitchhiked. And then she's like, from the airport? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> it's like one at night. It's like midnight. <laughs> I, I went with some stoned chick. I remember she rolled down the window, stoned as fuck, and like the whole window just like blew. And she's like, yo, what's up? Where do you need to go? And I'm like, I'm in Australia at this point. <laughs> Sweet. Um, broom experience was really fun because this is the first time I got flown in a private plane to a resort to work there. I felt so cool. Um, yeah, um, all right. I got there. I got my bed. We sleep in tents. It's like... In tents. Yeah, and like outdoor glamping. You know the glamping tents? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Basically glamping tents. I'm like, oh, this is sick. I love it. What the fuck? <laughs> like, yeah, you know, the photos have been, you know, like private beach. You can see whales jumping every single fucking day. You're like, this is so boring at this point. Like, I've been watching whales like nonstop. I'm like, okay, great. Dolphins, whales, whatever. Okay, so um, I arrived. I'm like, I just want to go work. So Brad comes out. Yo, Hubert, you're going to take over this section. I'm like, okay. And it starts, you know, 90 hour weeks. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> and yeah, I did half a year there. And this is also where I found spearfishing. So I learned spearfishing there. I met um, Dominic Matsumoto. He was the local Aboriginal guide. So it was like a Yavuru tribe that lived there on the uh, resort land. And um, he's he was like the local guy, teacher about bush tucker, so everything around the plants, the history of the mountains, all the knowledge. And I saw a spear. The first time I saw a spear gun was there, and from that point I grabbed this thing and I was like, I wanna learn this. I looked at it. I'm like, Dom, like my first paycheck. You have to show me where I can buy this. Like, what do I need to do to do to to, you know, learn this? He's like, Yeah, if you wanna come, let's go. He took me to some rocks. We were shooting off the rocks. Like, everything was wrong. First paycheck, I'm buying all the equipment. No money again. Whatever, I'm working. Who gives a fuck? You, you have board. You have food and water. Buying all the gear I can get. I need to learn how to spearfish. Basically obsessed. As I'm watching YouTube, how to become better spearfisherman. What should you do? <laughs> how can you not? Blah, 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 blah. The only issue is I'm living in Broome. Most tiger-infested, tiger-shark-infested waters in the world crocodiles freaking the water is always murky like dirty you jump oh, in you can no. see like <laughs> you can see and i'm like on the kayak kayaking like every day before work i'm just like i just want to catch a fish i didn't catch a fish for like three months four months it, it, it i was so obsessed i needed to learn it anyway i'm still cooking at this resort brad is like hubert with your attitude you can do whatever you want and this is this is the first time someone said something positive to me and this is the man who first time said, 
like was really open about believing in someone else and giving him the power to you know get out of his box that was the point where everything for me shifted i was like what do you mean i can do whatever i want he's like yeah power of obsessing about something you can just do whatever you want because i was saying i want to become a professional spirit fisherman and when you say you want to become someone professional it's like people take years and I was like, I want to be in like two years, three years. I'm like, I want to, I want to be like known for it. I want to be like famous. He goes, just go do it. And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, yeah, you and I, we go to Indonesia. You're going to learn how to spearfish in Indonesia for the first time. I'm like, what? Yeah. Um, he's like, when the resort is in um, wet season mode, no one goes there. He's like, we're taking holiday. You and I are flying to Indo. I'm like, okay, fuck yeah, why not? Jumping on a plane in Indonesia, me and Brad, he picks me up. For my first time in like an, like, you know, Asian country. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? Took, you know, the mopeds, everything, like Kuta, Kuta Bali. I'm like, where the fuck am I? What is this? You know? <laughs> and... I didn't stay long in the tourist area. I went straight up to like the Gillies and I started spearfishing there. First time in crystal clear waters. Um, you know, all the gear, no idea at all. I was just like, well, everything is self-taught. And and that was where it became dangerous because like I didn't know limits of danger. And so I was just like, I was doing everything wrong. If you could do something wrong, I was doing everything wrong. And... So I stayed at the Gillies for like three, four days. He basically gave me like a tour. Then we, and he's also like this free spirit where he goes like, yeah, whatever, let's do it. You know, yeah, whatever, let's do it. And every stupid idea you have, you will execute it with him. And that's the fun part. But you, that's good because you need people like that in your life. That's willing yeah. to just be like, fuck it, let's do it. Yeah, exactly. Well, we weren't scared. Suddenly we're in Kuta Lombok. So next island. Next minute, we are like on the east side of Lombok with like random guys that are spearfishing, frowning through Facebook, groups here, groups there, you know, we're paying them to take us out on boats, like those little jukungs, I, like I almost died like three times that day, I think, you know, it was like, whatever, it was the best adventure, you know, um, cool, so, you, you know, spent two months in Bali and Lombok and Basically, the idea was to go back to work in, in Broom on a pearl farm. Manual labor also counts for your two e for your second year application, right? You know, you have to do like the farm work. But it's not like picking bananas, oranges or apples where you just like get paid shit. Pearl farms are where the money's at. <laughs> I did not know. <laughs> you live on a boat in the ocean for like two weeks straight. And those two weeks are worth like hundred, I don't know, you get like $200 a day. Like don't, I don't know. I don't remember really much how much. For me, it was like shitloads of money. Another bimbo nugget. Work hard, find the pearls. No, but really, pearling is apparently where the money is at. Hubert tells me that he spends three months on a pearl boat shipping pearls to get his visa and get back to the resort. After his time on the boat, his mindset shifts and now he tells Brad that he wants to become a spear fisherman, but also become a freedive instructor. He does his research and he finds Apnea Bali. Hugh contacts Julia, who runs it, and says, I want to become a freedive instructor, what do I need to do? She says, whoa, buddy can't just become a freedive instructor. You've got to test your character, put you through some training, etc, etc. He's also required to live on site and take an extensive course in order to instruct. He decides this is where he's going next, Indonesia, to begin his freedive training in Ahmed. I'm just working out, living the best life in Ahmed. So no partying, no drinking, whatever. I was just like, you know, a happy chappy boy, riding my bike, working out, eating great food. You know, you know, like eat, pray, love kind of thing. But the male version, <laughs> without meeting any chicks, because I had no confidence back then for some reason. So whatever. I was just like, yeah, I just need to free dive. I'm obsessed. Um, obsessed with reaching long breath holds, big depths. You will learn quickly in free diving. It's not about numbers or anything else. It's about how you feel. And that was the complete opposite to, to cooking and hospitality. 
the more relaxed you are, the better your results. And after those six months, my life just switched. You know, like enlightenment. You can be the chillest person in the world. And because of learning how to teach people, for everyone it's different. Like you go into the water. Some people are scared of water. Some people are scared of like the ocean. And then making people trust you to follow you into the water and teaching them and creating a new experience is where you learn how to really teach someone something on, on without... Like in the kitchen, you know, people like are like very hectic and they don't learn a way of explaining. They don't learn a way of teaching. Where there, I'm learning a way of teaching people. And now suddenly, um, I never thought I would be someone who will teach anything. I'm meeting um, Peter O'Prandi, which is also like a very big mentor in my life, a person in my life. Um, so he's running Indonesia spearfishing charter at that point. And I'm spearfishing the whole coast of Amman every day. So I'm teaching free diving. I'm making my money with it. Um, you know, I'm living my life there. I'm just like the local wide spearfishing boy. People are calling me to, you know, go spearfishing. He's doing the same, but he has a website and everything. I was like, okay, sweet. I saw him on the water a couple of times. We exchanged contact. And one day I'm meeting him and he's like, hey, Hubert, like, yeah, like, it's so cool what you're doing. Like, hey, you want to join forces? And I'm like, yeah, why not? Mm, in the meantime, one guy calls me and he's like a crazy Kiwi dude. His name is Sonic. He's like, yo, dude, I got your contact from the spearfishing shop. I heard you're like the sickest guy. Like, I need you. I need you to take me spearfishing. I'm like, okay, bro, meet me this and this. I get you the gear. Let's go. I'm going out with him. Dude is crazy. Insane Kiwi guy. <laughs> I'm telling you, like, fucking insane. If you think being on coffee, on like 10 coffees, IVs, bop, bop, bop. He's like, you need to come to my, you need to come work with my team in New Zealand on the Chatham Islands. And I'm like, Chatham Islands? The fuck is that? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a great idea. Let's go. 24 hours later, I'm on, on a plane to New Zealand. Are you noticing a theme here? Every opportunity, let's go. Not to get all fucking woo-woo right now, but life is a game. And if you don't take risks or jump on opportunities, you won't level up. You won't get to those really cool bonus levels in the game where you get to swim in new secret worlds and you get the coins. You're just a better human. You get lives added on. You know what I'm talking about? You could be sitting on an unlocked talent or a passion that you didn't even know existed because you haven't reached that level of discovery yet. Comfort is dangerous. And I would highly recommend whenever you start to feel comfortable or in a nice little routine, ask questions. Spice it up. Chuck a little nugget of spontaneity in there. The results will be nice, and imagine where you will go. You might have an eat, pray, love moment. Hubert goes on to tell me that he now finds himself in New Zealand, of all places. After a short and random stint playing Arborist in New Zealand to kill time until lobster season, he flies down to the Chatham Islands and starts picking lobsters. Welding pots, filleting fish in factories, fishing for cod, but spent most of his time diving. For the lobster season of two weeks in February, you can make twenty-five to $30,000. After lobster picking in Chatham, Hugh moves to Queenstown and grabs a job at Rehab Juice. His one goal in Queenstown, though, was just to spend the time grinding at work, working out, sleeping, and fully resetting for five months. He does another stint of lobstering in Chatham's and does a short visit to Auckland. But we, we will get back to New Zealand again. <laughs> uh, it's a love-hate relationship. Anyway, that time, we're going back from the Chathams, Auckland, and I'm like, fuck it, I'm going to Bali. I'm going to open this company with this guy. I'm, go I'm going to be part owner of Indonesia Spearfishing Charter. Flying back to Bali, opening this company, bribing all the people to be as a white boy bully in the papers. Like, I own 49% of it because you can't own more. Um, basically, investing, like, a lot of money into it. Um, all the gear and everything and you know the structure websites in the meantime instagram is growing i think i was at twenty five thousand followers at that point um 25 26 or something like that and i was like yeah I i'm gonna become a professional spear fisherman and then i had a first sponsor which was andre spear guns 
Um, I'm diving over 200 feet. My breath hold is almost seven minutes. Um, you know, my views on Instagram and YouTube are going through the roof and I'm like living my spearfishing dream two years later. I was like, like this is fucking insane. All I did was just spearfish, 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 spearfish. And um, it's a lot of work to maintain your own business because everything depends on you. And that's the first like business venture that I had with someone who was teaching me about how to deal with things. And that's, that's where, you know, you, you're becoming a man, you know, like you're not a boy anymore. You cannot behave a certain way. You cannot do certain things. Uh, you need to learn how to talk with people. And well, in the meantime, I'm thinking of, so what's next? And I always loved catching the fish, hunting the fish there exploring Indonesia and, you know, like becoming better in videography as well as taking pictures. You know, I was living like, I was living the Instagram dream, but I was too lazy to maintain it. There was a point with like running two accounts over, I think both accounts were like 30 plus thousand followers. And then suddenly we're looking at 60, 70. And then one of my friends from, well, friends, basically a big YouTuber, Brody Moss, was over there and he had like 3 million YouTube followers and a huge Instagram and we were spearfishing together, making this whole video. You know, I'm living my dream. And that's where I met my then ex-girlfriend, now ex-girlfriend, Anastasia. She basically, like I kind of, it was love on first sight. That was pretty awesome. Like I never had that. I still look backwards at it like as a positive experience for me at least um and then uh, she was like we spent maybe like one or two weeks together we live like this kind of like dream thing you know we've had the best time in two weeks and she was like hey like i want you to be with me i was like okay well let's do it you know and basically i sold my bike everything i like i was like i don't want to do spearfishing anymore i want to go be with this girl but she's american uh she's from vermont a german guy who's a chef falls in love with american girl um like all i was doing was just basically spearfishing being super ripped and like kind of winging my life through an instagram like how to become a model and like how to get paid for my looks and i was like maintaining my super ripped statue at this point i was like oh that's sweet like i have nothing to lose so yeah she left to vermont we had like a long distance relationship for three months and we made a plan she's like hey let's go to germany i'll meet you there i'm like okay we spent two months in germany and we were trying to figure out a plan and she's like hubert I know what we can do. You're a chef, right? And I'm like, yes. I didn't cook for like three years at the time. She's like, we need to get into yachting. I remember. Yachting? And, and, I'm like, and she's like, I know how to get us in there. I'm like, really? Yeah. We have to do this course here and this. And then I know a company in the British Virgin Islands that will hire you instantly. And I'm like, okay. And that's how it happened. Suddenly... I'm in Vermont, first time in the US, with her, living at her mom's place with her. We're somehow, I'm like somehow trying to maintain like money, income with like jobs. I don't know, <laughs> just doing anything, you know? <laughs> Enjoying really America. Like I suddenly started like seeing other sides of America where like I've never been there, you know? Like for me, it's like, what the fuck? It's so weird. Suddenly I'm on a plane to the British Virgin Islands, getting the visa sorted, everything. Everything took like the whole procedure took like maybe four to five months waiting on those visas and uh, approvals and everything. And then I'm I'm on the Caribbean on like a, I would say for me back then was a big boat, like 58 foot catamaran. And I'm cooking for 10 people for seven days, breakfast, lunch and dinner. Just in front of them, you know, like it wasn't a big deal. And so I did that for a year with her and yeah, basically we were living, we were living together and, you know, like making money together and like living this Instagrammable dream. And that was our goal. Like we wanted to base money on that and like continue and like how can you, you know, this travel lifestyle cause it's 2016. Like what was your, um, workload like working on the yachts? Like, did you get like, was it like 40 hours or 60 hours? <laughs> how did you get time off and all that? It was 24 seven. 
that will put a lot of strain on the relationship as well. You can obviously imagine, especially being a chef and suddenly she's a stewardess and we have a captain. Everyone was spreading the load evenly. But um, we had something called a 24-hour turnover. So the boat drops the 10 guests off. You have 24 hours to clean every cabin, provision the boat again, and next morning, 12 o'clock, 10 guests come on again. And we did, I think our record was like 14 back-to-backs. That's what it's called. So 14 weeks with 24 hours to turn the boat over. And that's where like we hit our limit. And yeah, that was that was insane. And you know, you have people with dietary requirements. Hey, I want this. Hey, I want that. Can you make that? Chef, can you make this? Chef, can you make that? Chef, can you make this? Chef, can you make that? Oh, whatever. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Why not? And that's the beginning of your thing. I'm just going to scooch in here real quick. Hope you're enjoying the episode so far. A quick reminder, if you haven't already, find me on Instagram at hospobimbo and on YouTube as I'll be uploading the full video version of this podcast on January 27th. If you're enjoying the podcast, please consider supporting the show by heading to buy me a coffee forward slash hospobimbo. You know the spiel for the price of an orange mocha frappuccino. You can help keep the show alive. All money goes towards subscription fees, gear, and travel funds on getting here, there, and everywhere to keep supplying you the content that you deserve and the content I love. XOXO, back to the show. I, w- I was having a look at your website as well. We'll get to Sushi by Hugh, but do you do all the photography for your, your website? Like all the content that's being produced, is that produced by you? Yeah, that's like in-house right now. Everything we do. So I have, I have a team now which is pretty awesome. But everything uh, is basically like self-taught from how to use the equipment to... It takes me time to envision the things I want to like basically put out because I learned it with industry fishing that all the content was made at home. Um, As in, you cannot ask anyone else to film your underwater footage because it has to be you. So it was always like we have to learn how to cut videos, how to do everything. The YouTube algorithm just never hit, like never hit. I wasn't consistent enough. That's a really good skill to have to, I mean, we haven't even talked about Sushi by Hu yet, but <laughs> that's a really good thing to, to have to pump into your business. But I can imagine that you're wearing multiple hats. So there's just literally no sleep, no time to just chill. Jumping forward, you were in LA at some stage, you were in California, and then next thing you know, you're at the fucking Sushi Chef Institute. Well, <laughs> how we still, did that come to okay, fruition? Yeah, of course. Um, so I finished working on the yachts in the Caribbean. My relationship kind of like went different ways. Um, I went back to New Zealand. I kind of like had a big depression, I would say, like a heartbreak plus depression at that point. I didn't know what to do with my life, right? The only Mm -hmm. thing I had was my camera and my drone. So I was like, hey, I want to take just photos. And I had like this massive creative block for a whole year. Uh, All I did, I was just going to the gym, maintaining my life, kind of like sitting there on my money. And I decided I have to change it again. Um... I don't know, there was a point, like, it's just, this is the time where I learned how to build websites. I wanted to write a blog with the stories to, which you hear till now. With, like, I wanted to be motivating people to, to learn new things, to move forward, to, like, how... I wanted to create a brand where, you know, you can create a community of creators that, like, hey, you can have a motivational speech with someone. Just, like, I don't know, like... You can have a normal talk with someone who maybe has done it or not. And for some reason, I never got to it. It's still in like my mind. I always want to do it at some point. It's a big dream, huge dream. And this is where I was like, hey, you know, you have the internet. There is books. Like I bought the book called Social Media Made Me Rich. And I was like, I want to build websites. And suddenly I'm sitting in Auckland building websites. I built SPQR dot and that oh wow you know i'm like i took every photo like all the photos on spqr are mine and crazy yeah it's, it was like my first bigger gig <laughs> so from that point on i was like hey you know like whatever you put in your mind you have the internet if you put enough time into it and you research it and you 
combine your styles, like how you want to see other people do it. Like the information is free. You have money run, lying on the street. Like it's it's if as yeah. soon as you have internet, you can you can do whatever you want. It, mm -hmm. It's fucking insane. <laughs> well, yeah, um, I'm building websites. I I think I built like four or five websites. That I got paid for, and I was like, oh, this is not mine. Mm. So I applied for a yachting job again, on like a sport boat, like a sport sailing boat. I'm like, hey, I want to go back to cooking. And you know, like I'm yo-yoing between my careers. I'm just a yo-yo, constant yo-yo. I'm going back. Suddenly, I get this job offer. It's in Fort Lauderdale. I'm like, ah, sweet. I'm going back to the U.S. Uh, I want to go back to the U.S. I'm starting on this boat, maintaining um, it. And it moved to the Caribbean, to St. Thomas. So I was living in St. Thomas for seven months. And then, in the meantime, I was learning how to um, fly the drone, take videos with the drone, editing and everything, and taking photos, underwater photos, um, but I wasn't that passionate about it because the work workload was so big from the other job that I, c I couldn't maintain creativity plus workload, creativity and physical, like physically being tired. So it kind of always was just like it was bursts of creativity and then maintaining a high level and like, OK, break. And it, it's always fluctuating. So I'm working on this boat, loving life, saving money. And this is the first time I realized, okay, you know, this is a great career. So I like it. I enjoy it. Like this is, it makes me want to, it makes me do what I want to do. Next minute, I'm back in Germany with my friend, one of my best friends till today. We're still, he has a bar now. You probably see it like in my feed and I share it a lot. Um, back then we were like, we just met for a coffee and he's like, hey, let's let's create a company where we take photos for restaurants of their food I'm like okay let's do it 24 hours later we have a business to take photos of restaurants and we're like banging out job after job like it was stupid it was just like I'm taking photos for restaurant after restaurant and then I was like yo we're making every hobby into a job like it was just insane. Like the, you know, like for me, it was like I don't know what I'm doing, kind of. Like that's how it felt. But for other people, it was like, hey, this is this is epic. That worked fun. I was like, this is boring. I don't want to make my hobby to a job. So it was like a quick cut. Um, because I got called by a friend that I met in the BVI. Hey Hugh, can you fly into Cabo? I'm like, it's it's Wednesday, 10 p.m. He's like, when do I have to be there? Friday. I'm like what yeah we will book you a ticket for tomorrow morning you want to come like get on i didn't know the job who it was for where whatever he's like it's we will get paid well I'm like, okay quick chat with the captain i'm like okay i'll come 48 hours later i'm on a yacht in cabo on like a 45 meter yacht and they're like hey we're gonna cross from cabo to san diego to do maintenance you want to come i'm like okay why not i'm already here right let's go so we're doing the crossing and then we I'm suddenly in San Diego, you know, helping with maintenance, cooking for the crew, blah, blah, blah. And then the main captain comes on and he's like, hey, Hugh, you have a great personality. Like, I want to introduce you to the main owner of the boat. Um, I'm like, OK, cool. So, you know, tracking up the coast, wasn't really meeting the owner at that time. And I'm just like, you know, going along, like working there. I had like a not a contract just like hey like we're gonna keep you as long as we need to and then next minute i'm on a crossing to fiji <laughs> as you do <laughs> <laughs> i know <laughs> i know <laughs> suddenly i'm in, in fiji cooking on an island for like the boss and everything whatever and uh, for like the whole COVID time i spent on a tropical place surfing the most epic waves it was a lot of work it was a lot, of, a lot of work. I people, we, I had to feed for, like, I had to feed over like twenty five people every day. Wow. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner by myself, so twenty four seven. And it wasn't the easiest job, I have to say. It was paid well, um, and I did s fifteen months straight. So I worked for fifteen months with no break, and then I got two months off in between, like two months after that, and then I got sick. You know, like I didn't take care of my health. I had teeth problem, so in the mean, like I had to go back to Germany, and I was just like kind of like, hey, like I have so much pain, I had so much tooth pain, like I've I've actually like had a huge operation there, 
it, it took seven months to fix everything. And I was just like, oh my God, like this sucks. So I was debating about my next step because while working there, the people who hired me, they loved sushi and I sucked at it. I sucked at sushi so much. Like I learned, I tried to learn from YouTube and I'm like, there must be something that I'm doing wrong. It's the first time I cannot learn something from YouTube. Like it's not there. The information is not, you don't learn it on YouTube. There's just repetition and tradition and sense behind it where you're like, what the fuck is going on? You know, I'm like, I need to dig deeper into it. Of course, internet. <laughs> where do I learn how to become a sushi chef? <laughs> first thing you think Japan, right? But I don't speak Japanese. And not all Japanese people speak English. So it's no point for me flying to Japan. Mm -hmm. Like, so I found Sushi Chef Institute. Pretty much one of the best choices I could have made. Missing a front tube or like a plastic clip in. I was like, oh, I'm flying to like, <laughs> fuck it. Um, I canceled the operation to put in the, the whole teeth thing. I was like, and I need to get this course done. You know, it's the same attitude. It's just like, I need to go now. <laughs> I booked the course. I'm on a, I'm in a plane to LA. I'm so excited. So I'm staying at the sushi school with Andy Matsuda and I'm like, Hey, you know what? I'm going to put everything I learned as a chef into like a box and I'm starting from scratch. Like, I just want to learn what he will teach me. So I figured out that my knives were very blunt, even though I thought they're super sharp. And um, that was the first lesson. Mm. And then from that point on, it's just like, you know, learning what the cor course will give you. So I'm becoming a sushi chef. And it takes like two and a half months. In the meantime, I met a friend back in like all these stays from all these countries. You know, I had a friend called Patrick Durkin. I met him while I was in San Diego the year before. And he lives in, to uh, he lives in Altadena and he is an ex-pro uh, MMA. And um, he loves, he, he was, he's so into spearfishing that we exchanged like skills. Uh, we were like exchanging skills. I was like, hey, I was like helping him to understand spearfishing better, giving him tips and tricks and everything. And he was basically like showing me and supporting me in Los Angeles in this journey towards uh, becoming a sushi chef. And this is where Sushi by Who gets created. It starts in a friend's place where we caught all our seafood and invited his friends, for me, random people, to this apartment and I'm just banging out sushi for like, I don't know, seven, eight people. They go like on their phone, they're sharing all this shit. German chef is making us sushi. He's like learning how to become a sushi chef, blah, blah, blah. And he gets so many requests to do it again that suddenly I'm doing another dinner and we're charging money for it. Mm. And I'm like, whoa, what the fuck is happening? You know, like I got something. <laughs> I found something that I really enjoy because now I'm cooking, I'm spearfishing and I'm doing hospitality on like a whole nother level and it may just click. It's like, this is what I want to do right now. This is what I want to be. A final bimbo nugget. All of a sudden, the pivotal aha moment. Everything is cohesive. All the nuts and bolts of your tinkering and creative dabbling becomes a machine. These things that we do, whether you want to call them hobbies, obsessions, interests, they take up a lot of time and energy, but it's fulfilling. You love it and you love doing it. You don't know why, but you have to do it. But it's that back and forth struggle with yourself saying, okay, what is the point in all of this? Is this worth it? And at what cost? And one day, it all just clicks. You're now doing all of the things that you love in this new hybrid little beast that you have created, that no one else is doing. And that's the big magic right there. That's what you bring to the table. Be sure to tune into part two of Nomadic Hospo with Hubert next Friday, January 27th, coming out at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I want to say a big thank you to Hubert for sharing his story with me and for just inspiring the hell out of me. You've got such a great vibe about you and the hospo world is lucky to have you. Anyways, guys, that is chairs up for now. Thank you so much for tuning in and I will see you in the next one. <laughs>